Erica Hall from Mule Design, and you are in Paris 7. And if you wandered out off the street, welcome. Um, I'd first like to give a big shout out again to our hosts, to uh, Benjamin Wynn on the mimosa bar over there. He's the most important person in this event, always uh, putting this together. And um, today's speaker, I'm very excited. We are talking on the theme of play. And we have Holly Dittmore, who's a local, one of the localiest locals I know, um, who is a writer, uh, performer, and clown. Yeah, Paula. Um, she writes for the Burning Man blog, and earlier this year she performed a monologue called The Mother's Group about her experiences with parenting email lists, and I bet that's a lot of fun. So without further, anything, welcome, Molly. Thank you, Erica. Good morning. I've got my Madonna microphone on. Can everybody hear me? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm really excited to be here, and I'm, I'm glad that uh, the topic is play. I was really flattered when Erica asked me to talk about this. It gave me a moment to sort of reflect back on my life. Um, like she said, my name is Molly Dittmore. I'm a writer, I'm a blogger, a performer, and a clown. This morning, I will be your guru of play. So bear with me here. Um, part of what I'm going to talk about today, and since this is a, a creative crowd, is how play can impact your creativity. For me, play is a means of creativity. It's, it's one of my creative outlets. But that's, it's also my biggest means of inspiration. And it's not just a, as a writer or as a clown. It's really all of it. And when you give yourself the opportunity to play, you're giving yourself the freedom to really create something. And when you have that kind of spontaneous moment, spontaneity, spontaneity requires creativity. You don't all of a sudden get a spontaneous idea to drive across the country without that first creative spark. Uh, when I started thinking about this, I... Uh, my daughter's over there looking very confused, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> when I first started talking about the theme of play, I did what I uh, do when I start a lot of research projects, which is I go to the Oxford American Dictionary and I see what they have to say. And the, the, the one definition that stood out the most for me was the spontaneous play of children. And I think we all remember those kind of fearless moments of going down a slide, not caring who was looking. But somewhere along the way, we start to get inhibited. And I think when we get inhibited, we lose this giant sense of play. But we still have to be able to let ourselves go. And learning how to play, again, is learning how to let go. And you can't have this sort of spontaneity without creativity. It's the spontaneity, the creativity that leads to this kind of what Oprah, who also wears a microphone like this, would call her aha moment. Being spontaneous and being brave enough to be spontaneous is what leads to the great idea. So we're going to give ourselves the right to play. But what does that really mean? It means we're giving ourselves the right to freely create. You can create as much as you want. You don't have to create one perfect thing. When you create, just keep creating. Like, no one ever wrote one book and it was the best book. No one ever did one painting and it was the best painting. But you have to allow yourself this sort of freedom of fearlessness to try out things. And we have to be able to try out things without judging ourselves and without judging other people. When we're judging other people, we're really judging ourselves, like my mom would say. Well, more questions during or after? After. Cool. Thank you, Mary. That's an excellent question. And when, when we're trying out new things, I know it, it can be embarrassing, like if you think of your first dance recital or the first time you got up and did some public speaking, maybe you were a little bit nervous, maybe you needed a safe space to start that practice or start that play. And I think that this sense of play and having a safe space to do it is why things like SantaCon are so popular, it's, or the Valentine's Day pillow fight that they do downtown. It's adult play, but it's, it's in a safe place, and we're all doing it together. No one's going to judge you for being a drunk falling down Santa, because we're all drunk falling down Santas. Or, or the, the, the kind of fun high that you get from smacking a stranger over the head with a pillow right before they smack you over the head with a pillow. 
But I also think that this, this concept of having a safe place to create and a safe place to express yourself is why Burning Man is so popular. And I know it's a divisive issue. I know people either love it or hate it. But my creative roots really have a lot, have a lot of deep, deep, deep roots in that desert. And I'll tell you why. When I moved to San Francisco, I was 22 years old, and I was very much a creative, disaffected Gen X college student. I think at some point, I took it upon myself to be so cool that I had started to shun a lot of joy. And it didn't mean I was an unhappy person. What it meant was I didn't want to look uncool. And when I moved to San Francisco, I started working in the very infant, infant days of the internet industry. And I worked at a creative shop, not unlike, you know, I don't want to compare it to Mule, but 15, 16, 17 years ago, that's basically what it was. We were called a web boutique, and we made websites for big companies. Even though it was a creative environment, it wasn't my creativity. My creativity was amplifying my boss's ideas. It had nothing to do with me. I was a good writer, but I wouldn't probably have chosen to write about some of these things. Um, I wouldn't have necessarily chosen, say, to write the About Excite homepage, you know? <laughs> That's not true for me. That's not true creativity. And it was, it was pretty stifling. Um, so when I got to Burning Man, I felt free. And I know a lot of people say that, and they talk about, oh, it changed my life. It really did. It really did change my life. It made me open to other people. It made me see people in a totally different light, because everyone's the same. Everyone is the same there. You're not asking, what do you do for a living? Where do you live? You ask Burning Man someone where they live, and they say, oh, I'm camped at 2.30 in G. You know, their first you know, reply isn't always, I'm from San Francisco. So it's, it's an autonomous zone. It's a free zone. And I think that's why so many people have taken to it. That said, I don't care if you ever go to Burning Man. <laughs> there are too many people at Burning Man. But if you want to go, you should go. <laughs> um, it also, Burning Man, gives people this, this deep sense of play, which is very important. It is all about improvisation. You don't know if you're going to have the most fantastic conversation of your life with a drag queen in line for a porta potty. I had one of those conversations. You also don't know if you're going to find yourself at sunrise on a seesaw with a total stranger. Um, Bruce Sterling, the sci-fi writer, um, wrote a Wired magazine article about Burning Man years ago, and he called it the Great American Holiday, which I think is really the way to look at it. It's a time to celebrate creativity and freedom, and I think that's what it's given a lot of San Francisco, especially people in the creative community. But back to improvisation. I think that improvisation, spontaneity, and the, free the freedom that you feel to create is totally important. I was watching a documentary on uh, Charlie Parker, he died very young, and one of the things the other musicians were saying is that you're playing in the moment. There's this freedom that comes with playing off the drummer, playing off the trumpet, playing off the bass player, and trusting yourself in that moment to play along. And I realized that I'm not necessarily talking about playing music, but I think it's really the same spirit, that you can be free and trust yourself, and that there is this freedom in trusting yourself in the moment to just keep creating. And speaking of freedom, <laughs> I know this is why some of you came to hear me talk, because you love clowns. Is anybody here chlorophobic, the fear of clowns? Anyone? No. All right. Great. Sometimes people say yes, and I don't believe them. I think they just, you know, it's a little skeevy. There's a lot of freedom in putting on a clown face. It's a mask. People can't really tell who you are. I've had some people in this room who've not recognized me, who've known me for years when I'm dressed as a clown. My clown name is Couture. I'm a high fashion snob clown. And I don't know if you can really see the lights a little weird, but part of Couture's face is that she has one raised disdainful eyebrow. I don't even have to talk and I'm conveying a message as a clown. I can sit there and be quiet and watch, or I can sort of be shot out of a cannon. It works both ways. But my personality as a clown is definitely what is on the inside. Even though you can't really see my face here, that face is drawn from exactly what is on the inside. Clowns wear the inside on the outside, and I think that's maybe what makes people a little bit uncomfortable. Um, 
Another thing I do as a clown is, and my husband says I like to make people uncomfortable, and I think he's right, uh, but I like to take up a lot of space. I like to wear a big wig or a big skirt or a big nose or something because women in our society aren't supposed to take up a lot of room. I think that's something that has stifled a lot of women's creativity. We don't want to get in the way or we don't want to make too much of a, we don't want to rock the boat too much or we frankly are just supposed to be these tiny thin little nymphs. And part of Couture's stick is that she's big, she's brash and she's not going to take it anymore. <laughs> Part of play for me is being able to, and these are extreme examples of play. I don't expect everybody to run out of here and buy a clown wig. Although I will tell you where to buy one if you're interested. Part of the reason this whole clown thing has worked for me and for my sense of play is that it gives me freedom to act on something that maybe I wouldn't if I were standing here like this. I'm anonymous, unless you know who I am. But it does, and it also gives you, you know, people don't expect great manners from a clown. Uh, and so, I've allowed myself to act in certain ways and be a little bit more honest when I am a clown than if, say, I were dressed this way. Prime example is probably the first time that I felt real freedom and re real creativity as a clown uh, was in the late 1990s when I was laid off from Listen.com. I don't know if you've heard of Listen.com. It was a big music.com, started in 1998. They blew through hundreds of million dollars in three years. Um, it was really fun while it lasted, but slowly people were being laid off. It was like working in a graveyard. And it had gone from people writing music reviews all day and editing music reviews and doing all this super groovy stuff and putting on concerts to, you know, heads down, headphones on, very little creativity, certainly zero play happening. And I was dying to be laid off. They were even taking volunteers, but they said, everybody but you. I needed to be laid off because I needed the money because it turns out you don't make a lot of money when you work for a rockandroll.com. I needed that unemployment check. But finally, 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 in 2002, I was laid off. And, <laughs> and uh, I was the only person laid off that day. And the managing editor took me to this giant, giant conference room that had about 30 Aeron chairs around the an empty, enormous conference table. I mean, I think the whole company could have fit in there. And he laid me off. And I think he didn't want any tears, or maybe he didn't want me to tell my other employees that I had been laid off. And so he said, you can come back on Friday and turn in your HR forms. Clean off your desk. And I thought, well, good. I can't take three years of you know, rock and roll memorabilia home on my bike. But it was really unsatisfying. I'd been in this sort of dead work environment for years, and I was like, well, where's the epiphany? Where's this great sense of freedom that I'm supposed to get from not having to work here anymore? By the time I got home, I'd hatched a plan. That Friday, I picked up my best friend from the BART station, and we dressed up as clowns, and we went back to clean out my desk and make sure my HR forms were all in order. <laughs> I was wearing a Dayglow cheerleader skirt with a thong, not very appropriate work attire, a wig, really basic clown face. I wasn't quite that advanced yet. And my friend had, uh, when I picked her up from BART, she emerged carrying basically a bouquet of those really long, thin balloons that, you know, you go to the circus and they bend like an elephant or something. The woman is fearless. She had blown up these balloons on BART, dressed fully as a clown alone. She said that by the time she got to the Montgomery BART station, there was no one on her BART car. <laughs> she came up from the escalator holding this giant bouquet and wearing just the most terrifying clown face I'd ever seen. And I was like, it's on. It is on. This is that feeling that I wanted. And so we finally get to my old office place. And as, I, as we walk in, no one made eye contact. They were trying to act like we weren't there, which, you know. And you could hear the door slam, and you could hear phones ring, and I could hear the executives and their phones ringing, and I was like, God, are they going to call the cops, or am I going to actually get away with it? I make my way to my desk, and I start cleaning things off. My friend disappears, and I look up, and she's making clown balloons in the shape of genitals and leaving them on people's desks. <laughs> You know, I'm bending over, cleaning off my desk with my derriere hanging out. I mean, really wrong stuff happening here. 
Uh, at one point, she went and got a tray and filled it from the kegerator. We had six pints, and she was trying to pass out beer to people. I slammed one of the beers, grabbed my HR forms, took them upstairs. She was waiting for me. She knew I was there. But the look on her face when she swiveled around in her chair was amazing. I think she peed her pants. <laughs> and I handed her the forms and said, keep in touch. And she, <laughs> OK. And then as I floated back downstairs, I felt this huge freedom. I was done. But I also kind of realized who I was. I was, I was someone who wasn't going to take this kind of crappy job shit anymore. Do you know what I mean? I didn't have to ever put myself in that position ever again. And it was my way of kind of taking back my power. And that was really when I started seriously becoming a clown and thinking back on play again and again and how to keep a creative life and how to keep that sort of feeling going. Unfortunately, I should have said there were no pictures of that day. There were not really digital cameras back then. And, and, and it haunts my husband to this day that I have no, no actual proof. <laughs> Another thing that's part of play is something that my dear friend Summer Burks, you should follow her on Twitter, uh, called irritainment. And irritainment is sort of like entertainment, but it's not meant for everyone to enjoy. It's meant for me to enjoy playing my kazoo, or me to enjoy giving a child a drum. Or like that, <laughs> that guy in the mission who rides around on his bike with the giant speakers in the trailer behind it playing disco all the time, that is irritainment. <laughs> but he's feeling it, you know? He is being free. He's not letting anybody impinge on his experience, and I dig that. I do think that sometimes you do have to be a little bit more mannered, but you know, I'm talking about being a clown today, so we're not talking a lot about manners. But I think that it's, it's important also to not worry about annoying other people. It's, it's, it's not, you, you don't have to do everything for everyone else. So if it's, you know, putting a whoopee cushion under somebody, which is a favorite trick of mine, or, or riding around the mission playing, you know, blaring Donna Summer, do it. You're feeling the dream. And I understand, like I said, that these are really, really big examples. Um, but you do have to be open to other people. You can turn off a lot of people, and you will. But I think you'll be surprised who plays back. Whenever I'm dressed as a clown, I'm always surprised who will interact with me. Some people, you know, like I said, like when I went to my old office, just pretended like there was no clown in the room. You know, and some people are just like, uh, and or some people start screaming, I'm afraid of clowns. I'm like, eh, no, you're not. You just don't want anybody else to get the attention. What you have to always, <laughs> what you have to be open to is who's going to play with you. I was watching this uh, interview with the author Jeffrey Eugenides, and he was talking about how he didn't ever want his book to be, and he changed his mind because he wanted to make money. He never wanted his book to be in the Oprah Book Club because he thought that those readers were beneath his work. What a bunch of crap. Never, ever underestimate what other people can do because those are the people you're going to need to believe in you. You can't do this all on your own. I mean, why, why create an album for the two coolest people in the world to hear? Or why create a website that you don't actually want people to use because, you know, you don't want them bringing you down? And as a clown, I've noticed the thing, the people who interact with me, who run up to me, are the straightest. <laughs> they are old white men in khakis. They are, uh, you know, guys in Detroit sports jackets. They're not the people who I would have said, you're my person, and you're my person, and you're my person, because I don't really know who my people are. They have to come to me. And it's surprising, and you have to be open. And I think that's part of being fearless when you're being creative, is don't, it, don't, don't prejudge yourself, and don't judge other people. Now, back to clowns. <laughs> uh, that's me there, <laughs> if you can't tell. And a few years ago, I uh, and some of my clown friends, uh, more of the adult clown persuasion, we, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Ouchie the Clown, internet sensation, that's him, and uh, yeah, there's, these, this is the porn clown posse, by the way, this is some dirty, nasty people. Very sweet, very sweet. They would give you the leather harness off their back. Um, 
but you know, something that's, that's another part of play that, especially being in San Francisco, I love culture jamming. I love showing up and sort of flipping something on its end. And so we took a trip to Las Vegas to the AVN convention, which is the Adult Entertainment Awards. It's a giant porn convention in a giant airplane hangar style Las Vegas conference center. And it is the least sexy thing I have ever seen. I mean, these people could be selling vacuum cleaners, but they're selling, you know, toys and porn. And one of the things that was so weird was that, I mean, there's two kind of schoolgirl, porny girls here, but those people weren't interested in interacting with us at all. And we thought, oh, we're going we're gonna to jam them. No, it was the other people who were interested in us. One of Couture's favorite, favorite clown shticks is I carry a big roll of white paper with me. And when things get a little slow or there's room, I roll it out and a la Zoolander, I have a walk off. <laughs> and I go down the runway first as the fashion clown and then you know some other clowns will take a turn and then we start to bring other people in. The porn stars were not having it. The horny guys who were there to get their photos taken loved us. And I would not have thought that to be the case beforehand. I thought that's who we were going to be clowning. But in fact, it was the porn people who were really uptight. So my judgment changed. I thought I knew my audience, but I didn't. And speaking of knowing your audience, embarrassment. You have to be able to be embarrassed. And I know I said earlier to be fearless, but I mean, it's hilarious when you mess up. And if you can roll with it and keep playing, it's actually going to get better and better and better. This is a still from the monologue I did earlier this year that Erica mentioned. I had a, a really rough start to motherhood. I mean, it was great, but you know, things don't always work out the way you plan. I was tired, you know, all of these, all of these things. And so I, I sought answers in online mothers groups, which was a terrible idea. And um, because they're all as frantic as you are. And getting advice from frantic people <laughs> is a terrible idea. And I got kind of addicted to them because their problems were weirder than my mothering problems. And so they, they sort of made me feel like I was cr not so crazy. And I started collecting some of the crazier emails and eventually turned them into a monologue. Now, I think my favorite part of the monologue is when I talk about a woman who emailed this mother's group anonymously and was asking for help on how to stop her one-year-old daughter from masturbating in a high chair. I almost didn't include it in my monologue. It got the biggest laugh and it also made me realize how ridiculous absolutely everything is. Anything embarrassing can happen to you and it's always going to be out of your control. I mean, I don't know what I would do if Shorty over there started doing that, but you know, the other day she was screaming about having boogers. So it's, it's, you know, embarrassment isn't something you can stop, but it's something you can run with once it happens. Now, earlier, Jackson, who's here, said, how do I keep play going? How do I keep my sense of play going? And I realized that being a clown or writing a monologue isn't like everyday creative stuff. It can be, and it has definitely fed my sense of creativity long, 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 long time. But I think my favorite quote from my favorite movie is, this is Boogie Nights, and Don Cheadle is playing Buck, the cowboy, and they're talking at this party, and he's saying, I just don't know who I am anymore, nobody wants to see a black cowboy. And then he says, you know what, man, wear what you dig. And I think that is such a great reminder, just to be who you are and to just wear what you dig. You don't have to fit into someone else's uniform. And certainly, if you're going to be creative, be creative. Show a little bit on the outside if you're feeling a little bit playful that day. Uh, my husband sometimes wears an eye patch. He's not blind. Um, <laughs> my, m one of my dear friends, Polly, ha keeps a blue wig in the back of her convertible because sometimes she feels like having blue hair on her commute. I love that. I absolutely love that. And I think there are little ways throughout our day that we can be playful. You know, you can put on the eye patch. You can um, put on the blue wig. You can inspire other people by doing simple little things. And if you do want to be playful, the blue wig is a good introduction. If you do want to be playful, give a, someone a reason to talk to you. And it doesn't have to be, you know, irritainment when you're shouting with a bullhorn. But, you know, wearing a tutu for no reason 
you might have some interesting conversations throughout your day. And it's cause, because play isn't just about you. I think you can inspire other people by being even slightly creative in the way you dress, in the way that you talk, even decorating your bike. I used to have this big bouquet of these day glow flowers in the front of my bike, and I can't tell you how many people would stop their car to try and talk to me. I finally took it off. But they saw something and they're like, who are you? What's this about? And that was, that was kind of a really great reminder that people can be interested if you just look up for a moment or if you do something interesting. Now, Nora Ephron, my fav one of my favorite writers, her mother and father were screenwriters and they wrote um, plays for uh, Hepburn and Tracy, uh, all of these famous plays. And her mother, Phoebe Ephron, always told her daughters, everything is copy. And I think that's true about creativity. I think you can take absolutely anything in your life and turn it into more fodder for your creative work. You know, maybe, maybe you know, something just sparks it and that's it. Write everything down. Take a photo of everything, but use it all, especially if you're doing written work, making a movie, anything, anything visual, you can use everything you come across as copy. And you have to be your own muse. I know that sounds so like, Allure magazine, top 10 ways to do something great. But it's, it's kind of true. If you're not inspiring yourself, you're not going to inspire other people. And I don't think I'm always inspiring myself. I wish I were, but I'm not. Um, but I do think it, it is truly the most important thing to so being playful is to stay inspired. How do you stay inspired? You play. I think it's a big, 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 big circle. All right. Does anybody have any questions? Mm -hmm. Ms. Rosberg. You already answered one, which was how you incorporate play in your everyday life. You had a slide really early on talking about don't judge yourself when you're trying to be creative. Mm -hmm. How do you stop yourself from judging yourself most of the time when you're trying to be creative? As my therapist would say, self talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, I keep going. I keep going. I just keep going. I can't be afraid to be embarrassed because like I've learned, the embarrassing stuff is usually the better creative idea in the first place. Yeah. So in the typical work environment, I think the introduction of play and creativity is like really possible for just a creative process. Do you have any thoughts or tips on how to sort of get that all In a, that is a great question. I think I, I am someone, and I'm sure you, a lot of you have had this experience, where you have those like team building exercises, which are fun, but they usually end at a bar, and people just get drunk, and then the next day like half the people are embarrassed and don't want to talk to anybody, and the other half of the people are like high-fiving and new best friends, and so I, <laughs> I really, I, yeah, I, I did this disastrous scavenger hunt at an ad agency where I worked, and. It, it just always kind of brings me back to this place. And I think that there are, you know, trial and error. I think in, in the early dot-com days, we thought, like, let's do pinball machines and, you know, have a kegerator in the office. I think that probably the best way to play is to get out. It is, would be to, you do have to, to be together. But I think that, it, it, I mean, gosh, I think even something like going to Golden Gate Park or sponsoring a cart in the urban Iditarod would be fun. Um, getting people a little bit out of their comfort zone is fun, but getting them too much out of their comfort zone, it, it really isn't going to work. Um, did I answer your question? Uh, yeah, I guess I was thinking more just like in, literally like in the office when you're like working on projects, back in the day, like sort of people ask that sort of uncomfortable state of like getting yeah, I, um, I'm a big fan of like writing workshops and I think it's about creating that safe place. And I think that if you, um, I, I was talking to a chef and each week they, um, he brings in his sous chefs and they each make six meals or six dishes, excuse me. And none of them are ever going to be on the menu. So no one's competing, but they are, they, they've taken that level off. I think they've taken the competition level off 
but everyone really wants to create and they want to share with each other because they're all tasting each other's dishes. And I think this idea of not trying to turn it into the job is important, but, but keeping people creative without having to reward them financially or, you know, oh, I'm the one who won that. You know, I, I, working in, in creative field, I saw so many, you know, they would put two designers on something and one of their logos would be chosen. I, I don't think that's really making a great point all the time for people to keep creating because then, you know, oh, they got the job and I, I, I think that this, this idea of this even playing field where they're not competing but they're still creating is really vital. I also um, know that I think it's the, I don't know if they still do, but the, the SF Chronicle used to have a, an in-house um, photo contest, which is kind of neat. I mean, they're judging it, but it's, it's still, it's not, you know, national recognition level. It's among your peers. And I think that having your peers look at your work in a non-judgmental way is kind of cool. Anyone else? Any questions? Last chance for Ask a Clown, you'll have to do <laughs> Sure, okay. I think everybody's secretly uh, formulating their new identities in their minds. I think you've turned some cool rephobia into cool rephilia in your yeah. <laughs> yeah, and you all go home with two vocabulary words. <laughs> All right, um, thank you so much, Molly. You can follow. Molly Bloom. Oh, yes, yeah, Molly Bloom. Molly Bloom. You'll probably be getting a lot of DMs about where to get the proper proboscis. Yeah. Cry a lawn right over there on 7th Street has it all. Excellent. And as always, thank you so much for coming today. And please um, feel free to grab an extra beverage on your way out, but clean up all your cups and glasses. Thanks again to everyone who helped out, especially Parasoma, for hosting as they always do and letting us invade their space with somebody new and interesting every month. So we'll see you in November. Bye-bye.